Here are a few additional cool examples I wanted to show you of Diels Alder reactions. Imagine this molecule, butadiene, reacting with this molecule. You can once again picture the electron swinging like a door on a hinge out here to form a carbon carbon bond, these swinging this way and these swinging this way to give us this product. And this reaction, as it turns out, occurs even below typical room temperature at 20 degrees Celsius. How about this example? You can actually take an alkyne and do a Diels Alder reaction. One of the two pi bonds swings out, forming a bond between this carbon and this carbon. This pi, these pi electrons swing down to form a carbon carbon double bond. And these pi electrons swing out like a door and a hinge, forming a bond between this carbon and this carbon. Because this is a triple bond and it's only swinging out one of its two pi electron sets, it retains a double bond configuration in the product. And here's another example. If I take butadiene and react it with this molecule, which actually has two alkenes in it, I can get a diels alder reaction occurring on the left side to give me this product. And then if I introduce an excess amount of my butadiene, it will do a second diels alder reaction to the right side of this intermediate to give me this final product. So now we come to this final subject, predicting the product. If we look at a situation in which I react this diene with this dienophile, we could imagine it doing a Diels Alder reaction to give the predicted product. However, this diene over here is not a symmetrical diene like butadiene. And what I mean by that is this you could imagine this diene potentially forming a bond with this alkene, as shown here, or if it approached the alkene upside down, it could potentially undergo a Diels Alder reaction in this way. If you draw it out on paper, the orientation of this diene facing up or facing upside down actually will give you completely different products. So the question is, which of those products actually forms and how in the world can you predict it? The way we predict it is by drawing resonance structures. I hope you guys can see from the principles outlined in our earlier lecture on resonance structures that you can take the lone pairs on this oxygen and push them down here, simultaneously swinging these pi electrons like a door on a hinge out there to form a carbon-carbon double bond, and pushing these pi electrons out onto this carbon. That gives you this resonance structure right here that has a formal positive charge on this oxygen and a formal negative charge on this carbon. You'll notice that I can't do any real significant resonance structure in reverse, giving a partial positive charge on this bottom carbon. Separately, I can draw a resonance structure of this molecule, in which I imagine these electrons swinging up like this, just like a door on a hinge, to form a carbon-carbon double bond here, while simultaneously pushing these pi electrons up onto this oxygen, giving it a negative charge, as shown here. Contrasting the previous example, I can't show a real significant resonance contributor in which I end up getting a negative charge on this carbon down here. Thus, having this carbon-carbon double bond conjugated to this carbon-oxygen double bond produces a partial positive charge on this carbon at this position. Now, I want you to look at these two molecules and try to imagine how in the world would they get together. Well, if you understand the basic principle that opposites attract, that is, a carbon that has a partial negative charge on it is going to feel an attraction to a carbon that has a partial positive charge on it. You can see clearly that this carbon and this carbon are going to line up. I want you to contrast that with our examples shown over here to the right. I draw the same resonance structures and try to orient them in the opposite direction. Is this carbon right here going to orient with the carbon that has a partial positive charge? Is this carbon with the negative charge going to orient itself to match up with the carbon up here? The answer is no. Over here, I'm going to see the partially negatively charged carbon lining up once again with the partially positively charged carbon. I determined their partial charges all by drawing resonance structures. We can see that summarized here. Once again, from our resonance structures, we saw that this bottommost carbon has a partial negative charge on this diene. And this bottommost carbon on the dienophile has a partial positive charge. Thus, this is the way these two molecules are actually going to line up when they undergo a diels alder reaction, thereby giving me this product as the major diels alder product.
So that brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you've had an enjoyable time. I know I have. Feel free to take a break, rest up, get a snack, and then come back energized and enthused, ready to learn about Chapter 8's coverage of whatever Chapter 8 covers. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.